Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Governor Martin O'Malley to the Center for Effective Public Management uh, here in Brookings Governance Studies Program. One of the critical problems that we analyze in our work is how to make government work better for the middle class, for average Americans, and for everyone. Martin O'Malley has been a trailblazer in doing that as governor of Maryland for two terms and from 2007 to 2015 and before that in serving two terms as mayor of Baltimore. Under his leadership as governor, Maryland recovered 100 percent of the jobs lost during the Great Recession, was one of just seven states to maintain a AAA bond rating, and the College Board organization named Maryland one of the top states in the nation in holding down the cost of college tuition. Uh, the state also uh, uh, had the best uh, public schools in America for an unprecedented five years in a row. Uh, Governor O'Malley compiled a similarly distinguished record as the mayor of Baltimore, where time named him one of America's top five big city mayors. He's going to talk today about some of the public management tools that he helped pioneer as governor and as mayor that produced those results, and in particular, ways that he and his team used data to make government work better for everyone. Uh, he will uh, focus on the, uh, among other things, the state stat and city stat programs. After his remarks, my colleague Bill Galston will ask him a couple of questions, and then we will open the floor to your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Governor Martin O'Malley. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks very, very much, Norm, Ambassador Eisen. Thank you for your kind introduction, and thank you for setting the wheels in motion for, um, for this event. This was fun. Uh, and thank you all for being here as well. It's a great honor to be here at Brookings today. Uh, the people that work in, and, and around this building have done some really outstanding work on analysis and research on government performance. So it's a pleasure to be here with all of you to talk about data-driven governing, an issue that is near and dear to my heart. Our country and our world faces some big challenges whether it's making our economy work again for all of us or confronting security threats or climate change, but all of those challenges, confronting them, will require a government that actually works. You and I see a world where our creativity and imagination have now expanded. ...and help make so much of that progress possible. And yet creativity and imagination are not exactly the first words that come to mind with most citizens today when we think about our government. And I guess the question I wanted to explore a little bit with you off the bat is, what if they were? What if we tackled our biggest problems by using data-driven strategies instead of conventional wisdom or the way we've always done it? And what if we could make our communities safer by knowing in real time where crime was actually happening every day and then deploying police officers to those precise locations at the right times. What if we could put an end to lead poisoning of children instead of ignoring it as if it were a problem that just could not be solved? What if we improve public safety by using big data and the experience now that we have of years of recidivism to actually identify that small percentage, percentage of probationers and parolees who are truly the greatest threats to public safety. And what if, by sharing medical records and targeting the personal interventions, we could actually cut avoidable hospital readmissions by 10% a year every year? Imagine if the overall performance of any school could be measured over time so that citizens and, and parents could actually see where we were headed. 
Imagine if one common platform not only measured the job skills and greatest demand in a given county or metro area, but also allowed employers to find the skilled workers they need and unskilled workers to obtain the training they need to fill the jobs being created in this new economy. Well, as you might have guessed, in Baltimore and in Maryland, we did all of these things and more. And this, my fellow citizens, is the new way of governing. And it's not about excuses, deflecting blame, or ignoring problems. It's about transparency and openness and accountability, and it's about performance management. It's not about left or right. It's about doing the things that work, that move us forward. And it also is about setting clear goals, measuring progress, and quite simply getting things done again. You see, the old ways of governing, bureaucracy, hierarchy, these things are fading away, and a new way of governing is emerging. And it also calls for a new way of leadership at every level. Leadership that embraces a culture of accountability, embraces entrepreneurial approaches to problem solving, and embraces collaboration. Leadership, in other words, that understands the power of technologies like smart maps and GIS and the Internet to make the work of progress making open and visible for every citizen. This new way of governing has quietly taken root in cities and towns all across our country, and it's happening in blue states as well as red states. And pursued honestly and relentlessly, it holds the promise of a more effective way of governing at every level of our public life, local, state, and, yes, federal. Now, our approach to this, uh, to this was actually born in the subway system of New York City. In the early 1990s, there lived a great man named Jack Maple, Lieutenant Maple, actually, of the New York City Transit Authority Police. And Lieutenant Jack Maple believed there was a better way to deploy his police officers than the way they had always done it. And with nothing more sophisticated than paper maps and colored markers, Jack started plotting where and when robberies took place on his section of the subway. He called these maps of the future. And then he sent his undercover detectives and transit officers to stop criminals where they were most likely to strike at the times they were most likely to strike. And he put, in his own words, the cops on the dots. And Jack and his police officers drove robberies down to record low levels. The media came calling. And the new police commissioner came calling. And soon Jack wasn't just plotting out a strategy for part of the subway. He was made the deputy police commissioner of the entire New York City Police Department and developed a system that came to be known and used all across the country called CompStat. And the NYPD, under his command and under the leadership of Commissioner Bill Bratton, went on to reduce violent crime to levels that very, very, very few people ever would have thought possible in New York City 20 years ago. New York's ongoing success in reducing crime and saving lives quite literally led to a revolution of performance-measured policing in cities and towns all across the United States. And one of the first of those major cities was my city of Baltimore. You see, when I was elected mayor in 1999, our city had sadly allowed herself to become the most violent, the most addicted, and the most abandoned city in America, with more population loss over the prior 30 years than any major city in our country. And at the beginning of our administration, we were able to put an additional 20 police officers onto the streets of Baltimore, which presented us with a really important question, where to send them? Now, we could have deployed them equally to each of the six council districts. That would be one way to do it. Or if we wanted to be real political about it, we could deploy them to the council districts with the highest numbers of primary voters. Or if we wanted to be real, real political about it, 
we could deploy them to the districts where the greatest number of people voted for me. Or, or we could actually deploy them to the concentrated hot spots where the greatest numbers of our citizens were being shot, mugged, or robbed. This is the option we chose. And we repeated that CompStat process every day and every week, constantly searching for better tactics and better strategies to save lives and prevent crime. And over the next 10 years, Baltimore went on to achieve, thanks to courageous police officers and neighbors, some of the biggest crime reductions, in fact, the biggest reduction in part one crime of any major city in America in those ensuing 10 years. Now, there's a baseball equivalent of this ComStat strategy. Some call it money ball. Some call it the shift. You put your fielders where the past performance of the upcoming hitters says they are most likely to hit the ball. Put your police where crime is most likely to happen. The shift. That's the deployment of resources to maximum effect. And that's goal-driven, data-driven thinking. It helps win ball games, and it helps make a city safer. And we brought this new way of governing and getting things done, not only to our police department, but to the whole enterprise of city government. And we became the first major city in America to do so. We started to create a new culture, a new culture of higher expectations in City Hall, one of accountability, transparency, meritocracy, centered around results, and the constant search for better ways to get things done. The leaders started to emerge, and we recognized them, and their colleagues were able to see who their own leaders were in their organizations by their performance. And we set high goals. We used data to tell us whether or not the things we were doing were working every day and every week. And our city stat approach, like ComStat, was built on four principles, four tenets that we had adopted lock, stock, and barrel, timely, accurate information shared by all, rapid deployment of resources, effective tactics and strategies, and relentless follow-up. Always the hard part. Every two weeks, if you can picture this scene, on a constant and rotating basis, my team and I would hold city step meetings with the agency or department heads and their leadership teams up on the sixth floor of City Hall in the big room with the big boards and the screen projectors that would project the data that the department heads and the agency had submitted prior to the meeting. And everything was mapped out and everything was indexed to the previous reporting periods of two weeks before so that everybody could see and everybody would know. And ideas were shared and questions were fired back and forth if we failed to hit a goal, we wanted to know why. And if we hit a goal, we wanted to know how. So we could do it again and again. And it worked. We brought crime down by 43%. We reduced the number of children poisoned by lead in our city by 71%. And early on, when the former impatient and irascible mayor of Baltimore, William Donald Schaefer, my mentor and tormentor <laughs> accused our administration of having no vision. We responded with the 48-hour pothole guarantee. <laughs> and our crews actually hit that guarantee. And they hit it 97% of the time. And each of the members of those crews got a thank you note from the mayor when they did it. The Kennedy School at Harvard in 2001 gave us their Innovations in Government Award. Our innovation was that we started measuring outputs instead of just inputs. And of course, though, we didn't really, we didn't do city stat to win awards. We did it to survive. We did it to make our city safer and cleaner and a better place for kids to grow up. That, by the way, is the international mission statement of every mayor the world over. For many years in our city, it had seemed like the drug dealers were more effective than our own government. But thanks to CityStat, that reality was starting to change. And when I was elected governor of Maryland in 2007, 
we took this approach statewide and we called it state stat. And the goals were bigger and the measures more diverse. But the premise was essentially the same. It was data-driven decision-making, collaboration, follow-up, and results. And we shared those results, good or bad, with an online dashboard so that every citizen could access it and see where we stood as a people and where we were going with that important tool of ours, our government. And with this approach, we achieved something in public safety of a, uh, uh, like a public safety triple crown. We drove crime down to a 30-year low in Maryland, incarceration to a 20-year low, at the same time reducing recidivism by nearly 20%. There are not many states that did that. With this approach, our teachers, our principals, our parents, and kids with the financial backing they needed and commitment from us made our schools the best public schools in the nation for an unprecedented five years in a row. That had never happened before, and we did it in the middle of a recession. We cut in half the number of children placed in foster care, driving that down to the lowest levels on record. We set a goal of reducing infant mortality by 10%, and when we hit that goal, we kept going. And we reduced infant mortality by more than 17% overall and 25% among African-American families. We took on the big challenge of health care costs with a commitment and a goal of driving down preventable hospital readmissions by creating a platform for health care providers to share patient information by mapping the incidents and the locations of chronic conditions and people who suffer from them, and by aligning the profit incentives to wellness rather than to sickness, we drove down avoidable hospital readmissions by more than 10% in just the first year of trying. It used to be in Maryland that governors of Maryland would set a 40-year hope for cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay. We instead started to measure actions and results. We created BASTAT to identify and map not only the sources of pollution, but the actions that we can take together on land in the right places to halt the flow of pollutants into the rivers and streams of the Chesapeake Bay. We set uh, not a 40-year hope, but two-year milestones. And we took measurable actions to reduce stormwater runoff and to expand the number of acres planted with winter cover crops to upgrade clean technology at all of our sewage treatment plants throughout the state. We made it possible for citizens to click on any of the tributary basins where they lived to see whether we were making progress and hitting our goals to restore the health of our waters. And for all of that effort, we reduced nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment levels by 14, 15, and 18 percent respectively. We restored hundreds and hundreds of acres of stream buffers and natural wetlands, and we doubled the number of native oysters that are now filtering the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. Did we meet every goal we set? No, we did not meet every goal we set. Uh, but with true performance measured governing and with openness, failure has to be an option, albeit a temporary option. If we met every goal that we set, then we probably weren't setting our sights very high or picking very worthy goals. One tragic example is this. After six years of, of steady progress, uh, saving lives, increasing drug treatment, uh, Maryland, like many other states, experienced a really deadly spike in heroin overdoses. So we set a new goal. Instead of merely expanding drug treatment, we set the goal of reducing uh, drug overdose deaths by 20 percent. Uh, we made some progress reducing prescription drug abuse by mapping out facilities and doing a better job of monitoring the pill mills and shutting them down when we identified them. We got more people into treatment than we ever had, but it wasn't enough to prevent or reverse this tragic spike. As with any of these efforts, when what you're doing is no longer working, you have to come up with new approaches. And so we did. And so we must.
What I've learned in uh, 15 years of executive service, taking ComStat to CityStat, taking CityStat to StateStat, is that the larger the human organization, the more important performance management becomes. We should not ever accept the excuse that because it's so big, it can't be managed. That's a cop-out. Our framers never set out to create a nation that muddles through or gets by with less. We came together to form a more perfect union. And data-driven decision-making and performance management, making our government work, are essential to that mission of pursuing a more perfect union in these modern times. As some of you know, uh, may know, the problem at our federal level isn't a lack of goals or a lack of data. Man, we have agencies with dozens and dozens of goals and performance metrics and strategic objectives. But what are the truly big goals for our nation? And what are the actions that allow us to achieve those big goals together? Too many federal goals are about process, not about outcomes. And having meetings is not a goal. To the public, all of this process, process, process means very, very little to their lives. At our federal level, we have to have a clear view of the most important things our government is setting out to accomplish and why. And this requires clear goals that reflect what we, the people, actually value. And the difference between a goal and a dream is a deadline. Without a doubt, there is no progress without jobs, and job creation should be our highest goal. But let me give you just three other examples that speak to our values as a people. The infant mortality rate in the United States of America is the highest of all the developed countries in the world. If we value reducing infant mortality as a nation, then our goal at the federal level should be to do just that by a measurable amount by a certain time. If we were to reduce infant mortality across the nation at the same rate we did so in Maryland, we would save more than 4,000 American babies a year. That's 4,000 families that would be spared at that unfathomable loss. It is so easy to become lost in measuring everything from soup to nuts. We must measure what we value and value what we measure. Second example, if we increase kindergarten readiness across the nation at the same rate we did in Maryland, we would have 825,000 more American children ready to learn on their very, very first day of school. That's 825,000 more children that would not start out behind. 825,000 more children taking their first vital steps towards success in education and therefore in life. Final example. If we reduce preventable hospitalizations across the country at the same rate as we did in Maryland, we would keep 600,000 more Americans out of the hospital each year. That's 600,000 of us on our feet instead of flat on our backs in expensive hospital beds. In other words, Americans should know what our federal government's top five objectives are. Job creation, improving the security of our people, improving the education and skills of our people, improving the sustainability of our way of life, improving the health and the wellness of all Americans. And federal employees should know how their work and the work of their agency contribute to the achievement of those objectives. And leaders, staff, and the public should all know whether we're making progress together and where work still remains to be done. Finally, coming to the table at the federal level cannot be simply a box checking exercise. We're doing this because somebody said we had to do this. And what good are lofty policy goals without follow up on the ground in the small places close to home where it really matters. What we need is nothing short of a new method of executive management, a method that becomes central every day
to the important work of our federal government. Our federal government's objectives should be a reflection of what we value most and those critically important things that we can only accomplish together. Now, early in my administration in the city of Baltimore as mayor, we would hold regularly, it seems in retrospect, every week, <laughs> uh, town halls, community meetings all across our city. And we came together as a community and as a people to talk about our fears very often, to talk about our frustrations, to talk about our hopes. And I invited uh, neighbors to come and ask me, their mayor, anything. And at one of these meetings I will never forget in East Baltimore, a little girl about 12 years old uh, came up to the microphone and she said, Mr. Mayor, my name is Amber. And there are so many drug dealers and addicted people in my neighborhood that people in the newspaper refer to my neighborhood as zombie land. And I want to know if you know they call my neighborhood zombie land. And I want to know if you're doing something about it. The question that she asked of me was really a question that she was asking of all of us. Do we know? And are we doing something about it? Because behind all of our data, there are real people living their lives, shouldering their struggles, working hard every day to give their children a better future. And they deserve a government that works. Thanks very much. Thank you. Shall we talk? Now we talk. Mic'd up. Sure. I think it's on now. <laughs> you guys are very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me begin by introducing myself. I'm uh, Bill Galston, a senior fellow in governance studies here at the Brookings Institution. Uh, and I want to congratulate the governor on his speech. I cannot imagine a more appropriate speech to be delivered under the aegis of the Center for Effective Public Management in Governance Studies here at, at Brookings. Uh, let me also add on a personal note that if you could find a way of bringing your 48-hour pothole guarantee to Washington, <laughs> D.C., I would follow you to the end of the earth. <laughs> and so would 500,000 other people. <laughs> so that caught my attention. It's hard to do in the middle of the snow. Yeah, well, it seems to be hard to do in the middle of the summer in this city, but that's a different point. Uh, uh, I am, in, I am informed that there's a little bit of wiggle room on the back end, so we have close to half an hour for the question and answer, answer period. Let me tell you what the plan is. I'm going to ask you one question, then I'm going to turn to the audience, first taking four or five press questions, and then moving on to this very large and interested standing room audience that has gathered uh, to hear you talk and to hear you answer questions. If there's time at the end, I will, I will wrap it with a question, and if not, I won't. So uh, let, me, let me begin with my question. Uh, as you know, uh, there is a pretty long history of trying to bring effective goal-based performance measures to the federal government and to bring it more in line with the sorts of governance that you talked about in Baltimore and in, and in the state of Maryland, I think it's fair to say that those efforts have met with incomplete success. And the level of current trust in government reflects that. So 
what is what is your analysis of why these prior efforts haven't gotten the job done? And how do you think that your approach would have a higher chance of, of actually being able to bring goals and effective performance measures to the federal government? I think, I think it's important to realize that the, the ability to actually collect this sort of data and to do it in real time is a relatively recent uh, phenomenon. I mean, 15, 15 years ago, uh, I remember like 90% of the requests for service came in on paper in the city of Baltimore. So the internet, GIS, even Excel spreadsheets and those sorts of things, uh, they were a relatively recent sort of uh, technology in terms of making our government work. But I think um, uh, one of the great variables in all of this is leadership commitment. There are many, many mayors who visited our city stat room and saw the big boards and saw how nice it looked and how effective and 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 they loved the picture uh, but they lacked the commitment when they got home to actually do it every day uh, because it does require the leader not to sort of shout with a megaphone from the top of the organizational triangle it requires you to be in the center of this search for truth and to to be there constantly, a, a presence in, in the middle, if you will, of a collaborative circle. I think mayors have taken to this a lot easier than governors, frankly. I mean, if you look, there's more and more literature coming out on this. John Bernard just did a book called uh, Government That Works, where he traces this. Uh, mayors embraced it first, and I think it's because the work that mayors do is so very, very visible that they never enjoyed some sort of information situational advantage of knowing what was going on six months before the public. I mean, everybody knows whether their city's becoming cleaner or safer. So mayors have, been, have embraced this first. There's a lot of governors that are now heading in this direction. Uh, they, were, they were slower. And there have been some points in the federal government where it's actually kind of popped up there. Uh, the Recovery and Reinvestment Act was one good example. But the great variable here is, is really executive commitment. You need the executive, whether it's a mayor, governor, or president, very committed to this, not as some sort of one-off press conference or a nice announcement. He or she has to be committed to this being a new way and a new method of executive management. Thank you very much, Governor. And I will now turn to the press questions. I believe that most of the press is in this sector, and so if you just want to raise your hands and identify yourselves and then we'll move on. Yes. Hi, Let's wait for the microphone. Sorry, I should have said that. Hi, Governor. <clears throat> Hi, Governor. Ben. We have another one. This one doesn't seem to be working. Uh, I think they should read it first. And I, mean, I, uh, I, I, I think that uh, we have to be very careful about uh, uh, lowering our standards, whether it's environmental standards or whether it's uh, how we how we treat workers, uh, just in the interest of getting a, a trade deal done for the sake of the trade deal. I think that we should be, when we enter into trade deals, it should be with a view towards uh, yes, bringing down barriers, but bringing up standards and. Uh, uh, I don't. I think we should consider very carefully and not in a precipitous way uh, that proposed agreement. Thank you. Sure. John Wagner from the Washington. Ooh, uh, I don't know that I'm di the. I have many times, John, as you know, from having covered state government for many years in Annapolis, uh, answered for you as we abide by all of our state rules on emails. I've many times turned over emails in response to FOIAs, uh, even though some of them, due to colorful language, might have caused my mother great embarrassment. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll abide by whatever FOIAs we have to turn over. Uh, 
we had a retention policy, and, and um, you know, unless there was open litigation or an open FOIA, we generally would hold on to those for a certain number of weeks, and then and then uh, and then delete them or, or purge them from our system. So, but we'll, but we always abided by whatever the state law was on that, and I relied on my legal counsel to do that. I understand there's a press there's also oh, no I'm sorry. Uh, there's also no archiving uh, requirement in Maryland on emails. Though we did archive a ton of state stat operational memos <laughs> for all of you to peruse for eight years. I understand there's a press question in the back. Our official duties. Probably. Uh, in our, I, I, I'm not expert on federal requirements or or, or state requirements, and I'm, I'm, frankly, I'm a little sick of the email drama. But in our state, uh, whether you used a personal email or the public email or a carrier pigeon, it was all a public record subject to disclosure uh, in response to any FOIA. You're not going to ask about emails, are you? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Lauren McDevitt with Hearst Television. The message you brought here today, Governor, is this something you want to share with the national audience as a presidential candidate? Well, I'm, that's, I'm seriously considering running in 2016, and I believe that if we want to uh, continue to, to heal our, our economy and, and heal our democracy, we're going to have to make our government work, and we're going to have to do a better job of making our government perform for the dollars that people pay for it. Uh, and I think those three things all go together. Uh, so I, I think this, I, there's not a doubt in my mind that this is the new way of governing and getting things done. And you see it emanating out over these last 15 years, up from cities to states, and this is how our federal government should operate. And some entrepreneurial department heads in the federal government already are operating this way. But it is coming just as sure as uh, the rising tide of expectations of Americans under 40. They see their banks being able to operate in secure and personally responsive ways. They see it from retailers. And they want their government to actually work and perform and function. So, yes, I, I, I intend to... Uh, talk about this uh, whenever I can. I believe Dana Milbank has a question for you, Governor. Yes, hi, Governor Dana Milbank uh, from The Post. This all sounds like terrific stuff you're talking about, but perhaps may not fire up the Democratic uh, primary electorate. How do you propose uh, to do that? I'm going to be giving a number of talks over the course of these next couple months, um, including uh, a discussion about how to make our economy work again for all of us or at least the majority of us, which with wages declining for 12 years in a row, it's hard for us to say that our job's done. We're creating jobs again, but we need to get wages going up. Uh, uh, there there uh, are many, many challenges, as I alluded to at the beginning of these remarks. I mean, I was, uh, appreciate Brookings having an interest in, in effective governance and performance management, which is why I came here to give this particular talk. But in order to meet the big challenges we face, whether they're security challenges, whether it's uh, climate change, or uh, whether it's fixing what's still not working in our economy, it's going to require a government that works. And I think people are actually far more interested in, in uh, a functioning government, in effective governance, and in people with executive experience than we might give them credit for. Take a last press question and then begin to the, and, and then move to the audience questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Governor Jeff Earl from the New York Post, how are you? Just to put it, uh, forgive me, an email question, to put it more directly, w were you satisfied with Secretary Clinton's uh, response yesterday, which I'm, I assume you saw, that she or her attorneys personally 
went through her cache of some 60,000 emails and determined on their own which ones were personal and which ones were government and turned that portion over to the State Department. Or, and, do, do you think there's a public interest in having an independent person or some other entity figure out whether all the proper emails were scooped up? Jeff, um, I, re I respect your, your, your interest in this issue. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't watch the press conference yesterday, so I don't, I, I don't know. You know I don't, I'll leave that to you to figure out. I, don't, I didn't really, I didn't watch it. Because I was working. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like an excellent note. Uh, and, oh good, this does allow me to stand up. So I, and it's been my experience that the people in the back get short shrift at Brookings events. So I'm going to reverse the usual procedure and start back there. There's a gentleman on the aisle. That's right. You got him. Good morning, Governor. My name is James Moore. I'm a Presidential Management Fellow with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. You spoke about having uh, real-time statistics on fighting crime. Did your administration also measure community policing, police training, and building trust with citizens and communities? Yeah, thank you. Uh our whole campaign in 1999, James, was, was all about community policing, uh, uh, ComStat, uh, what was sometimes called at the time zero tolerance policing. Uh, so we had a very, very robust conversation in 1999 about all of that. Uh, and our, our strategy was that we needed to improve the effectiveness of our police we needed to do a better job of policing our police, which includes some of those things you mentioned, training, uh, random integrity stings, beefing up internal affairs. We staffed for the first time with independent detectives a relatively new civilian review board, and, I, and we put the money in to give them their own detectives so that they could investigate cases. Uh, we tracked openly and reported regularly the number of discourtesy complaints and excessive force and those sorts of things. And um, the third part of that strategy was to intervene earlier in the lives of young people. But those three, more effective policing, a better job of policing our police, and intervening in the lives of young people. And then we put the numbers out there all of the time. And we put out a big plan and we took the plan all around the city. We did town hall after town hall after town hall in every single district. and. Uh, uh, when bad incidents happened, as, as, they, as they do and as they will, I mean, no profession is, is, uh, you know, is uh, above bad incidents or bad actors, we, we address it in a very forthright way. Uh, and, and we continue to uh, put those numbers out there more openly and transparently than we ever had before. Uh, and I guess some of the strongest proof that we were able to maintain that precious consensus and that, that basic level of trust uh, was in the fact that in that first campaign after these discussions, we won every, sick, every single council district, uh, including the two of my two opponents, which were the two hardest hit areas by crime. And even with a much increased police effort, and the rolling back of open air drug markets and a an heightened level of enforcement, I was reelected with 88% of the vote four years later. So, look, this, uh, there is no issue uh, around which there is uh, uh, greater fear and, and pain uh, in America over our racial divisions, probably than around the issue of public safety. And there's just no substitute for leaders wading into the center of those fears and, and leading the conversation uh, and the dialogue and making these institutions of policing and policing the police more open and transparent. Thank you. There's, uh, there's a hand right there. 
can't tell whose hand it is, but I am certainly willing to recognize the bearer. Hi, uh, Jim Snyder from I. Solon, uh, a member of the D.C. Open Government Coalition and a resident uh, uh, in Maryland. Uh, my question is, what is your definition of a high-value data uh, set, and specifically, does it include politically sensitive data. Now, this is an endemic problem all over the country as governors and mayors open up their data sets. <clears throat> there tends to be a significant omission when it comes to politically sensitive data. And just to motivate that question and provide two examples, three of the questioners from the press asked about the email and you responded to the second one. Then our state email is a public record responsive to the Public Information Act. That's not quite true in the way it sounds. Um, just motivate that. In my district, we have a, it's a billion dollar school district, and they rotate the archive every 30 days. And the Public Information Act is 30 days. Sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off okay. there. I think the governor has the gist of your Sure, yeah, okay. I'm sure but the point is, you can't actually use the, the, uh, the uh, access email with such a situation. And this, this type of loophole is widespread in Maryland with uh, a, a whole variety of databases. Well, yeah, and there's also, I mean, I had to answer that. Uh, Maryland was named a leader in the open data movement. I think we received some award from, from somebody that watches this and, and matches these things. I always looked at open data in the operations of our government as, as kind of genies that needed to be released from the bottle. And it was my hope that as much data as we could get out there and open up, that it would be very hard once people started actually using it to see whether they might be like with a river keepers organization or uh, PTA or uh, advocates for uh, whatever, more responsive policing, that it would be very hard to put those genies back in the bottle. So we, have a, we were a leader in that open data movement. I hope that the... Uh, my successor has kept that going, uh, and we also got better at uh, arraying it in, or putting it out there in ways that people, that it wasn't so dizzying. In other words, making it easier for people to, to use it and manipulate it and create charts and graphs and those things. And all of that is still an evolution. Back on the, on the email stuff, uh, yeah, we had a retention policy, and, uh, but if, if there was a FOIA filed, uh, we held on to those and turn them over. Um, we don't have an archiving requirement, and it is uh, an open question of public policy all across our country. How long should governments retain? 90 days, two days, three weeks, who knows? Uh, open and interesting question in the age of electronic information sharing. The, the, I think the most important information, though, is really about the operations. And I thought that's where you were going with your question. Because I've seen the look in the eyes of a lot of uh, veteran mayors when they saw the city stat room. And when they saw that they were going to have to own their last five years of service <laughs> by putting it all online, uh, I could almost see the look in people's eyes and saying, we got to get out of here and we're not doing this. <laughs> but the newly elected mayors really have fresh opportunities. And these men and women, when they first come in, I think are taking the bar to a constantly higher and higher level. Uh, and, and I think it's also why you're seeing people moving back to cities. I mean, nobody wants to live in a place that's becoming more dirty, more dangerous, more violent. Uh, conversely, when cities become more livable, when they become safer, I mean, you're seeing younger people moving back to them and cities are starting to function and uh, people kind of vote with their feet. So I, it's uh, causal and not merely coincidental that people are returning to cities, particularly younger people, because they see that their governments there are being operated in more open, transparent, and personally responsive ways. Uh, yes, the woman in the red dress right there. Hi, I'm Miriam. Um, I'm with the Data Quality Campaign, and we've talked a lot about um, crime and stuff like that. I'm focusing a little bit on education. Um, what kind of measures did you take to address high school graduation rates, um, post-secondary success, and just seeing, you know, which high schools had the best outcomes, and did you have any success in raising graduation rates in Maryland during your time as governor? Uh, yes, we did. 
uh, and uh, we we had uh, success in raising graduation rates in Maryland. We also had uh, tremendous success in getting more of our students to take STEM-related AP exams uh, and uh, and to pass them. In fact, I think a greater percentage skip more a greater uh, or a greater percentage of uh, Students in Maryland take and pass AP exams, STEM-related AP exams, than in any other state in the country. A lot of a rendition of this can be found on a great online blog. It's called Letters to the People of Maryland, and you can find it on Tumblr. And there's a whole section in there that has the strategies that we pursued on education and the metrics that we looked at to drive up graduation rates, AP success. Uh, and on the post-secondary uh, piece of things, we increased, I think, by 37% the number of associate degrees that were awarded uh, compared to the benchmark year 2006. And all of this is on there as well. I mean, how did we do it? We did it by a number of different strategies. Each of these goals, by the way, we developed a uh, delivery plan for, uh, for achieving those goals. And that delivery plan would lay out the leading actions that we needed to take in order, in concert, to drive towards those goals. So in, in schools, we greatly increase funding for schools, you know, elementary, and, uh, but we also went four years in a row without a penny's increase to college tuition. I think did a better job than any state but Montana over those eight years at holding down the cost of in-state tuition. Uh, we provided better training for a lot of our, our high school teachers, particularly in, in the STEM field. We uh, greatly increased the uh, readiness of kids entering kindergarten to actually learn. So, But all of this is laid out in uh, letters to the people of Maryland. I wrote about four blog entries a day for the last 20 days of my service. And uh, it's 380 exciting pages for those of you that want. <laughs> well, uh, Governor, as I promised, uh, I would reserve the last question for myself. Uh, and I would ask the audience, after uh, Governor O'Malley has finished answering my question, to remain seated while he uh, is able to exit the room expeditiously. He's generously given us some extra minutes at the back end for which, for which we're grateful. And uh, uh, Governor, let me just preface uh, my question by re repeating something that I told you when we were chatting before this meeting, uh, namely that I did uh, work for about two and a half years in Bill Clinton's White House. And in that connection, uh, a, you know, a statement that you made a couple of weeks ago uh, touches on your vision of leadership uh, and many other things besides, and I'd like you give, to give you a chance to, to comment uh, on your comment. Uh, uh, you said, uh, triangulation is not a strategy that will move America forward. Uh, history celebrates profiles in courage, not profiles in convenience. Interesting choice of words under the circumstances. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so uh, let me just ask you very directly. Uh, is it your view that the country did not move forward during Bill Clinton's two terms? No, it's my view that our country moves, can only move forward now on the uh, power of our principles as a people. And whether you're talking about foreign policy leadership we should always be leading with our principles rather than expediency. When it comes to leadership here at home, when it comes to uh, uh, immigration, when it comes to the need for continued reform on Wall Street instead of offering up Dodd-Frank light so as not to offend uh, uh, any, uh, any Democratic Party uh, loyalists in Manhattan, uh, I think we need to continue this job, and we need to do it on the principles that unite us as a people. Uh, when those refugee kids risk starvation uh, and, uh, and all sorts of suffering to arrive at our doorsteps, we should stick to our principles and treat them with the, uh, as the generous and compassionate people that we are, a people whose 
enduring symbol is not a barbed wire fence, but the Statue of Liberty. And so that's what I mean when I say that uh, the triangulation will not allow us to solve our problems. Uh, splitting the difference between uh, the way things have always done and some extremist view of the way things might be is not going to move us forward. We have to be clear about our principles as a people. We have to have enough faith in the American people to tell, to, uh, to speak the truth about the challenges we face and what needs to be done in order to overcome them. And that's what I meant by that. Thank you very much for that answer and for your appearance here at Brookings today. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Right out. Thank you.